Well, welcome everyone um, to another virtual conversation. Um, we've started this uh, event, these events when COVID hit. So we've become uh, not quite masters, but we're getting better and better. <laughs> Nathan is a master. Nathan's doing very good. <laughs> Today, we're so happy to um, welcome and speak with William Schaff, a renowned artist. Um, we could go on and on about accolades, but today we're going <clears> to <throat> hear from the horse himself, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> and um, take, a look at, take a look at the current exhibit that we have at the Art Center um, up through February 16th. And of course, uh, joining me today is our brilliant leader, Catherine Bergman. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. He makes me look good. Definitely. You both make me look good. Uh, well, we are. We're delighted to have Bill with us. And for those who are not so familiar, um, Bill has been working in primarily the state of Florida and his beautiful studio in McIntosh, Florida that we can see right now for 60 plus years. And um, the current show has representatives from different uh, decades that we are proud to share. And Bill has had 85 plus group shows. He's been in 25, solo exhibitions. His works are represented in many museum collections, including the Harn Tampa Museum of Art. Um, I saw the Kentucky Derby Museum or their collection among others that I was intrigued by. And uh, he's taught at numerous universities, received uh, a number, attended a number of artist residencies, including Yaddo and Mac, the McDowell Colony. So we are really in the presence of an epic creator and uh, visionary. So we're anxious to speak with him about his works and to hear some of his stories. Welcome, Bill. Well, thank you. I really want to thank you both, both you and Nathan and the the FAC for just how wonderful and kind and generous and professional you've been and for all the wonderful things that are coming out of this show. I'm very, very happy about it. We thank you. Okay, so um, we're, we'll start our, what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the show basically for anyone who has hasn't been able to come in and see the show. Um, this is the next best thing, um, but we do recommend coming in to see it. Obviously the textures, the mark making, um, you'll be able to look through these pieces and get around the glare, <laughs> which my camera could not do. So um, it's a really, really great show. And it's set in our Gamble family, family gallery with a couple of pieces out in our, in our sit and tell Founders Hall. Um, and we'll take a look at the first piece here, this really impressive bronze uh, piece called Chinese Rainbow. Now off to the left or the right, um, Bill has written stories about each of the pieces in the show. Well, almost all of them. Um, so you can oh. read, read those while we talk, but mostly we'll want Bill to give us some insight into what we're looking oh. at here. Would you like that now? Yes, please. Well, I think in 1988, I had a 20 year retrospective at what was then called Valencia Community College. And it was a lot. And that was a whole week's worth of work and running around and doing everything like that. And um, I was rushing about and I was supposed to make something out of clay this piece, by the way, is uh, kind of like a Lovely. a big poodle, or it's uh, <laughs> well, the dimensions are there. I think uh, um, you know, it's like you wrap your arms on it, your arms around it, and 
we'll carry it around with some effort like that. But um, this is a collaboration. I'll give Michael Galetta credit for it, who has still been there at Valencia College. So I was rushing around and I, I stuck my head in the clay door and said, I'm late doing this and said, will you start something up for me? So he started up um, basically what would have been the bottom part of it with the rear legs not quite formed and stuff. And so I came back maybe an hour plus later and there it was and I just hit it. I never had a very, very seldom I worked so fast. I finished it in about two hours and there was, um, you can see these markings all over it. And I think that's, that was the beauty of not having time to refine it. And it turned out, you know, it was the handwriting I call it, whether it's on clay or, or drawing it showed up. And I remember I had this one particular kind of big saw blade section that was really a great tool like that. So he, when it, when I started sort of like a kind of a wayward sheep and then it just went boom, boom, boom like that and put it together. Um, and it at the time was a, a clay obviously and it was a celadon piece. So it had this very light um, pale warm uh, green, not like this at all. I think this says we're, uh, we're at seven out of eight. So they started off, everything started off just to mimic the clay work. And so we, the first one or two of them were very, um, very light and, and trying to be the celadon pieces of it like that. And in regards to other pieces that when we first started doing bronzes, that's another story, but uh, they, um, <clears throat> we tried kind of reds, you know, like the traditional look. And then it somehow it arrived to everybody concerned, especially at the foundry, that we wanted to try to mimic making them look like jade and turquoise, malachite, uh, lapis dose stones. Cause I always figured they were special, they were powerful and they were healing stones. So this is an example of having, um, trying to go for that kind of jade look, which is um, mm -hmm. great. And then I think this pairing in the in the lobby is such a great illustration of the relationship between your um, 2D work and your 3D work, where you have, especially this horse's head in particular. Um, I know so you didn't have a story for us on this one, so we don't have to go into it, but um, just as an illustration for everyone watching today about the relationship between 2D and 3D work and um, I will I have did, another I, piece. Go ahead. Um, Bill, I did want to ask too. So the clay piece was created when and then the bronze came in 2018. How much earlier was that clay uh, horse created? The first clay came, um, excuse me, the first bronze, the clay came from the bronze. I'm oh. sorry, I take oh. it back. I'm trying to think <laughs> correctly here. The bronze obviously came from the clay. It, um, I don't really know, maybe a couple of years later. No, actually it was, um, what's the date here? 20, so each each bronze is gonna be at a different date, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. It's a seven out of eight. One of the things that happened that actually, my, I guess I could tell it right now, but, uh, uh, the big piece, the big Tantra girl clay that we, was too heavy to bring um, was supposed to have been for someone. Uh, and I warned him, I said, you know, anything can happen with the kiln gods and, and it did. And then it, it almost fell away at one point. It, um, it was so cold, we had to put electric blankets on it for three nights and then it had, um, <clears throat> somebody had left the gas on, probably me, and um, when I, it had its own kiln, and when we turned the gas on, it exploded the whole kiln, and the, the piece, and I was running around with the skin peeling off my hands, and I went to the foundry, called the foundry guys up, and because we talked about, just talked about having it uh, become a bronze, and they said, ah, no problem, just bring it on back, we'll, we'll put it back together again, but since it was broken then, big chunks had come out of it. The person didn't want it again. And I, you know, I had told him that, well, if it breaks and I, I would paint it and stuff like that, he still didn't want it. So um, 
Mary Lane, who's been a great patron over the years, saw all of this from the sidelines and she approached me and said, let's make a Tantra girl. Let's make a Asaba, which you have there, and let's make a Chinese rainbow. And that's how they got started as bronzes. So that was probably right mm -hmm. around 1990. So that was mm -hmm. kind of the first one, a couple of years later, like I said, of the Chinese rainbow. And then the rest mm -hmm. um, just happened as they did. So you might uh, you might make a form or the history, and, and when you choose to make the bronze, it could be 20, 30 years later, yes? Well, not that far. Um, maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know. One of the, um, the bronzes are expensive to make. You know, I think when I, when, mm -hmm. uh, I had the chance, I wish I'd have made more of them un, unpatinaed just to have, because mm -hmm. the bronze industry, you know, it's like, price of bronze in China can affect things. It's you know, the, just metals and the price goes up and down. But they, the, when I had the first Tantra girl, I quickly realized that um, Bud Bishop at the Harn Museum at the time said he really liked it, but he couldn't actually go and try to uh, solicit funds for it. And so we put it there on loan. And the real, the true factor is that if, it, if it's not going to happen. Nothing is going to happen unless you have a piece already made. And usually, mm -hmm. if it's a, if you have the blessing of having it on loan with the museum, for example, then you, in that case, it was the Horn raised the money, and then it was a group effort, and then then you have enough to pay for it. It's a triple win. Um, so, yeah, the variables, and this can be seen in the different type of patinas that that are at work and mm -hmm. uh, so there's not. there's tantra girl yeah the bronze tantra girl there no that's the, not the tantra oh, girl I'm, the one that we left at the studio oh. this the progenitor the story was the wooden one uh was wanted and i said no that is uh, it's not for sale um and then i said well we'll make a bronze of it which that in, in that case that yeah. piece is called swanee this one and yeah, we didn't make that bronze yes. until maybe 10 years later and, it, and it, the name it's called yeah. swanee here it is yeah, it's called yeah. swanee because uh, in uh, 50 60 years ago george ferrara a wonderful woodworker george nakashima style of work was taking uh, classes and uh, with a guy named uh, i forgot his name but uh they had a big flood and uh, this piece has a piece of wood which is floating around it it may be this rare wood called pitho colobian south american wood and then at that time at 19 or so i was i started working on it and i hit it with a chainsaw and i got it sort of like this and then we started refining it and there was some point i simply didn't know what to do with it and this this kind of little voice said just follow the grain and i followed the grain and so that's what led to this shape and it's amazing abstract equine shape that um, arrived. And it's interesting to note that when, um, when we did make a bronze of it, that one of the difficult features was when it was a wax, it still had the grain in it. So that foundry had to, had to make, get rid of the grain in the wax form because you couldn't have a, a stone replica looking ah. like wood. So, mm. so as a result, back to the Tantra girl story so that he didn't want the guy at the person at the time the person didn't want this this uh 1a bronze of it so I took um didn't even have the wooden original I just took copies of it six polaroids and the, the clay piece the big heavy clay when the actual Tantra girl <laughs> showed up and was twice as big twice as heavy twice as erotic mm -hmm. so um so I wish you had a photo of her in your studio. And when uh, Nathan and I went uh, several times for visit at Bill's studio to choose for the exhibition, we had identified the Tantra girl Bill speaks of. Um, but when it came time to move everything, she was too heavy. And with three, three of us, we couldn't budge her. So, but she's um, very similar in form, but yes, larger. Um, so that we had envisioned the three to be able to refer to one another, but at least we have the beautiful wood uh, 
wood sculpture and Swanee in bronze to represent. You know, and they're wonderful as, to see them as a pair. Yeah, found wooden piece actually, in a sense, in many ways, this is germinal piece for things in my entire career, at least in sculpture. Mm. And you know what? It, it it's so uh, amazing, Bill. The versatility. When I think about you carving in wood, um, that just seems so other than to working in clay because you're using power tools. You're uh, yes, you're sculpting essentially, but I think your versatility as represented in the show is amazing. All the media. Well, I never think of it like that, but I it, I notice it when we have a show of it. It's just a little <laughs> bit perspective with it. Uh, the thing, you know, they're all different. The clay is like that poem that Ann Tilton wrote and John did about it. Uh -huh. it, just, it, it lends itself to to smacking it around and, and cajoling it and cussing at it and trying to make it come. And again, working fast is fine. Coil building is completely different and methodical, say, than wrapping clay around palm tree matrix and working with, one thing about wood and stone, and I really miss working on them, especially stone lately, is they're alive. And you, it's like the old Michelangelo uh, and Rodin quotes about trying to make that life come out of this big block and the fact that they left some of it intact, you know. So you're very aware of that, um, the yeah. life of a thing, and then it makes you blend with it and makes you want to like do it justice like that. Oh, these are great to look at. I haven't really seen them that closely. And uh, mm. I am evoked to say that I, I never really planned these. I have found some some early photographs of the drawing of the dolphin jump them and I, it was educational. And then I just start, I just start up. I don't really have, very seldom do I have a plan and draw a model of it. Sometimes in sculpture actually more than this. When I, when I see this, I just see, I mean, it's like this beautiful matrix. You want me to tell the story of this guy? That, yes, that is an amazing story of uh, how it, <laughs> you essentially destroyed it and then it was yeah. reformed, yes? Yeah. And go ahead. Well, how do we start, you know? Uh, so we had this, let's start with the, the, um, the paper. It's actually paper, it's a beautiful paper. Um, and like I said, Sam Gillian gave it to me actually in mid seventies when I was at Penn State and big roll of it. So the roll is as tall as you see the picture and unrolled it and had, had two different ones going on at the same time. The other one was at the studio. So <clears throat> this was, uh, duct tape to a flimsy piece of foam core. And I'd been working on it, I don't know, maybe a year something off and on. I work tend, tend to work things, especially in two dimensional work. Um, it's like herding a hundred head of cats. I'll do 10, 20 pieces, maybe, well, makes it core, maybe eight pieces at the same time. And mostly because I just don't know how to solve things. And so I let them alone and then you know, a day later, a week later, a month later, they might show themselves to me. It might be years later. I think I used this one as a rug at one point before we even put it on the foam core, meaning we walked on it. And uh, so while I was working on it one morning and I was kind of fed up with it and it was like, I wrote, it went whack a whack a whack, it started bouncing around. And that was, it was the final slot. I just took out this um, hunting knife and I slashed it to ribbons. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, my temper got the, the worst of me. But, but I've often, I, I realized after I just said that, that sometimes when I was just be so frustrated with something, say that's working on a table, I just take my arm and just run it over the whole table and throw everything on the floor and to start over again and just make chaos and then they say, oh yeah, I need to throw this one away. You know, I need to do this and that with the other like that. In this case, completely cut it up. It must have been, it was, it was just like an accordion of open spaces like that. So I was a little distraught. I was thinking, oh, what do I do here? Do I do, I do a swan dive at the third floor window of the Gainesville studio? And I just like was in a bit of a turmoil. And then again, and like a little voice says, well, we always talk and Bill about process and then he leaves to be, they used to see. And then, then it was just saying, well, this is what you did today. And 
there you have it. And it's a mess. And so what are you going to do now? And so let's go fix it like that. So we took it down to Miami and archivally put on a piece of what they call gator board, which is about about three quarters of an inch thick. So I made it archival. They needed heat to put it on and, and this awful toxic pair of double glue. Mm. We got it back and um, so it was stable and it was not going to go, you know, it was a unit then, like kind of when you put a frame on something. And even then my, uh, my great assistant, Ollie Watt, I, he must have spent a week with Elmer's glue and weights, gluing another 40 stitches around like that. So, so then when you look at it, I mean, it's a gift from nature. Then, then afterwards, when looking at it, and there's something somebody would call, you know, scars and rips and turns with it. And, and I was just saying, well, that's part of it. And then I could see it integrate. And that actually led me to whether or how I might apply the look of things like this. So this is the, being cut was no different than what we've got here with the dolphin and, and I guess another part of it like that. And by the way, I just, I was an abstract expressionist person before I ever did anything, you know, in, in college I was doing uh, six foot square photorealistic paintings of yeah. Alabama policemen's head with their other helmets and Darth Vader gear. And then a sculpture, I would wrap plastic around <clears throat> armatures and burn it like na the napalming that was going on. And um, with the slashing of uh, the dolphin jumped over the moon, you sound like you're a bit of a performance artist as well. <laughs> yeah. As long as I just keep it to myself, I guess. <laughs> But we would have never have known if you hadn't sh shared that story, Bill. Well, you go but, back then, but then it was beautiful too. The um, how you, the accompanying guardian you started to yeah. Let's know, go back to that. So if I see it, yeah, I can talk about it. Started to wipe the paint on guardian. And yeah. Uh, so so we kept working it, and uh, during that time, it was in 1980s. Uh, I had this clay piece here fired at the um, University of Miami and we made skis for it uh, as well. And you make the skis because you hope the ski will break before the piece does. Well, the skis broke and they actually, be, two, both of them became integrated to coffee tables by two different artists, John Mydock and um, George Farrar. So this was broken. I think the front right leg that you're looking at was broken off and then it got glued back on and then I had gesso on it and, then it, and I didn't know what to do with it. I just put gesso on because I wanted to cover the clay. I wasn't actually even thinking of painting it. And it stood about 10 feet away, 11 feet away behind me um, from this painting, Dolphin Jumped the Moon. And at one point, one day I, instead of wiping my paint brushes off on cloth to clean them, I just started wiping them on the horse, on a horse called Guardian, which by the way was, uh, had five legs instead of four, it was all coil built. Uh, it had Romanesque arches in it to make, make it lighter. And uh, so as time went by, I just kept putting the pigment on and then the end result is what you see now. So it became obvious to me that they were a pair and it was as if the guardian jumped out of the painting onto mm -hmm. this world. It reminds me of that kind of Kurosawa film when uh, I forgot, this one of his last ones with about eight little episodes. And one of them is a guy is standing in a gallery and he's standing in front of a Van Gogh painting and he puts one leg in and he puts another leg in and the next he's walking around inside the Van Gogh painting. So I guess the guardian is walking mm -hmm. uh, it <laughs> flew out of the dolphin, jumped the moon. Mm -hmm. All of these things are instructive. They, they're gifts. Um, they tell me whether I like it or not, who, who I am, how I am when I'm totally ignorant of myself. And they, you know, the whole, uh, that Paul Simon line, incidents and accidents. And because um, I, I would be the kind of person to get a brand new pair of pants and I'd spill something out the next day like that. So <laughs> it, it was, it, you know, and I, I've learned a lot about that. So I'm so, so fortunate to have the doorway of, and the allowance of being what, being a creative and being an artist that 
they could make use of something that was, you know, just no matter how hard I try, I just keep making messes and having accidents like that. So it was wonderful to have a, to be an artist in that sense. So th those two, um, it should anyone fall in love with them? They go together, right? They're sold as a pair. Yeah, they're never the sold. Culture and the, the unit. Meaning. Yeah. They, they get sold as a pair. So they're a pe and they're twins and triplets, I call, for various reasons. They might have been twins or triplets because they were done at the same time, like, and integrated, like, the dolphin jumped the moon. They might just be because it was one, two, three, so have a similar topic like that. I've let some go. Um, so I've let them get broken up, but uh, definitely not these two. They, mm -hmm. I would consider that if somebody was talking masterpieces, no, I mean, I'm not, a, I don't think of myself as a master, but I, that would be the dolphin jumped the moon and guardian would be a highlight of my career. There's mm -hmm. about a half a dozen that I would say that about. Mm. This is, uh, you want to talk about this one? Mindy Breaks. Um, I was firing it with Daryl Adams, who's a sixth generation Georgia Potter here in Gainesville. He's a great, great help and friend. And and uh, what what really made it break was that I was working at Sean Sections in Vero. And we do a lot of wonderful clay work together there. And this was semi hard and the head was facing the other way as in to look back. And I, I just, I, I didn't like it. So I said, well, I guess there's enough leeway to do this. And I took the piece and turned it around so it looks like this. Well, it destroyed the integrity of any molecules staying together in a wetter fashion. And so when we actually fired it with, I mean, we bisked it and it was okay. But when we fired it with Daryl and it was probably, in his firings, his bisque are like as hot as a wood fire. And I think, think I must be 20 pieces. and. So Daryl was joking with me and says, I, I wasn't there at the time. And, and he said, well, all these pieces, I, I dare not throw them away because I think Bill might want to use them like that. And so Bill did use them and it took about a year and these things got like this. And uh, it's a really interesting insight into that. Like, you know, you can always play these games of filling in entire cracks and so, sometimes on other pieces where you see these blank spots, I would, maybe get a piece of real turquoise and put it in or maybe I would just paint it mm. and then the rule would be that well this I ran out of pieces that I could find and I put them where I think they, they should be and then do I mess around with that some more and that's totally an intuitive choice or just let them be as the zen moment of them happening like this and and allow them and so that's kind of was a little there was a few things got filled in but I really love this piece and I love that it was um, well, a samurai sword family, fifth generation swordsman was, would say to you, says, if I make an excellent sword, then I am excellent. So if I feel like I'm broken into pieces on some bad day, then I can say on the whole, let's make it whole. And that's what these, that's, I'm, a, I'm more of a repairman than anything else. And I don't mind when a piece breaks because then there's their archeological find. And I don't mind bringing, I mean, my friend Ron Chester, who used to work at the Museum Service Industries in, in Gainesville here at the University of Florida, who really knows how to make things look really old and archival, was, has often helped me with things by submerging a piece in liquid glue that would keep it from being too fragile. And I, one day I walked in and said, Ron, you want to paint on this some? Like, because I was too timid to get this more orange look. It had been more of a paler look, a uh, paler tan look, you know. And he said, sure, you know, and I said, knock yourself out. Like, so this green part on the head was much greener. It was almost mm -hmm. black green like that. And so I took some of it off, probably took too much of it off. And I'll call him up again and say, come on your turn. Let's go and have at this a little more. So I just love it. And I, I'm not much of an artist at all with, without the different collaborators that I have, whether it's the foundry, whether it's the repair guys and wonderful repair people in Bellevue, south of Ocala. Um, uh, Matthew and the, the Leak Enterprises, it's called. And if when there's something I don't want to repair or something really needs super duper archival repairing for the big time art world, I'll take it down to them. We have the best time and he, he gives me little hints every now and then. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just really a favorite piece. Um, he repaired, uh, Matthew Leake paired down here at the bottom of this one on the right, it had 
cracked heavily. I'd had put turquoise in it, mm. it and it just looked uh, right, right in front of the two rear legs all the way across. And it just looked so crummy that to me that it's not really exactly. I, I said, let's, let's make it like it's okay, you know? So he did all of this like that. I, I had a big hole that I never could get right with. So I put that piece of stone in it and I've got pieces of stone. Listen to that. <laughs> am, I go, am I good to go in? I'm hearing something. I'm good to go in, right? I can go in. Is that one of our attendees no. who needs to mute? What? I don't know what that sound is. Um, it's very strange because everyone is muted, so I don't know. Thank you. What if that you're is. a member. Uh, oh, that's what? Kelly Simone. Okay. Oh gosh. Oh no. Like what's? Thank you. It sounds quieter now. Thank you. Mm, so even though Joyce is showing as muted, it's coming through from work. Is that Nathan? Oh, just a second. I think it's Deborah Rose. Everyone. Sorry? I think it's Deborah Rose. Uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, I don't see Deborah Rose on the list of attendees. So. When, when the noise started, her name popped up, and she's in my. Uh, view here. Deborah Rose. <clears throat> ah. <laughs> Looks like she went away. Oh. <laughs> I love your okay. background, Leslie. Yeah. Way. All right. Sorry, Bill. Let's, oh, that's all right. That was you weird. Reminds me of this thing I saw once on YouTube about this. Uh, I wish I could remember her name. What? woman young younger woman concert pianist was playing and the piano went bad and so the guys dropped the piano down into the basement of the playing part and she kept playing it as it was going but she was actually bending over and playing the piano and then they got her new one and then it came up and she kept on playing the piano then <laughs> what soulful adaptation mm -hmm. so he uh, matthew fixed this one great and i, and I I love, I love this one. I and, love this. And, and I've had the, the joy of being in the gallery and saying, well, now nobody else is allow, allowed to do this, but lifting the lid off and showing the marbles inside. And, yeah, and that's that, real delight for. Yes, I like to have, a, have that kind of thing happen too. <laughs> and this was done with the help of John Tilton, John and Ann Tilton. And if you look carefully in the middle of it, there are six broken lines. Yes. That comes from the Book of Changes, the first number e. one, the 64 numbered hexagram of divination. I'll use the arrow sticks to throw it. The first one uh, is the male principle, which is all straight lines of the dragon. Mm. And the second one is the, called the roaming mare of receptivity. And the roaming mare is six broken lines. So I often put that on the pieces as well. Mm. Just, just for me, means to be gifting and offering. Uh, it's, it's lovely too for those visiting the gallery um, to see how you honor so many of your uh, mentors and collaborators in the writing. So it's, it well, seems I... like each piece has a, a whole uh, uh, assembly of creators that that are there with you well this brings to mind when i was in uh university of illinois in urbana champaign i was there with bill wegman with uh, bill nichols with bernard fisher or all these kind of people like that and we would note that the undergraduate students would like would sneak over to the next person's uh cubicle and kind of thinking, you know, I better, I'm going to take that. I hope they don't see me like that. And then I'm going to give them lectures about, hey, there's nothing new under the sun. You go ahead and take what you want. Just honor the person and tell them that you want to see what you can do with what they're doing. I mean, I don't want to, to get into it too much. You know, I, I mean, Leslie and Nancy are here. They have no, no idea. Well, maybe 
some idea how important they were in my own work because we all had we're in the same we were students at the same time you know uh, and, and how they what they do and their their dedication and their you know, finding after seeking kind of things very important so we still have a great tribe of of um, Florida artists uh, that most people aren't really aware of and thank you both I, since I'm talking about you Mm. <laughs> Boon Man, I want to talk about that. I don't, um, we don't even have the piece here, but it was uh, the cocoon kind of uh, astral travel kind of super person, kind of Hanuman figure just started showing up a long time ago, actually. And it came up in a painting, actually, once that was a no way you can fail demonstration where you you mess up a painting and then give it to people and they have they mess it up and then they have to agree like students or whatnot fourth graders could be anybody and then they have to say that it's ruined then i'll come in with my hunting knife and i'll scrape it and, and an image will show up like that and one time i was doing that with this piece called astral drift which is another story but um the wing was kind of the cocoon man the piece that has the mirrors in it is also another version of the a cocoon uh, figure. I like it. I like that you use that word, um, Catherine. So I, I'm using it now. And I made little ones, one maybe three inches tall. I have one at the studio. I saw one which I kind of, you know, talk about pairs, twos and threes, a kind of, um, which I had, you know, it was around, but that's okay. I, it's an impetus to make more of them like that. And it, I don't know, it has to do with mummies and has to do with, um, uh, I don't know. Now the cocoon figure also appears in the painting alongside. Yes. yes. Same thing. And the painting, the painting actually you could say probably was the beginning of it. And I don't even know what the date, what did I say there? 1880s, 1980s. <laughs> and uh, I'll, this is a great story about this one. And uh, um, it was a very, uh, it might even been one that was with the uh, collaborating painting with uh, Craig Rubidoux from a show at the Ringling in 1990. Um, big size painting. It was very painterly at one point, very painterly. And I often, you know, wish that, um, if you pull back on that for a minute, so I can, I, I, it helps me talk about it. Um, it, um, it was just sitting around, it was doing that. It wasn't, I don't know, I can't remember the different phases or maybe it was finished a long time before I thought it was, but one of the big factors in it was for about a decade, um, I met someone that um, had been going to Peru and doing, um, um, staying out with the shaman folk and doing alkaloid medicines. And I started going with him, which changed a lot of things when basically uh, two two big realizations was that we're not solid. <clears throat> we're energetic, pulsing, um, vibrational molecules, and we we just sort of a grosser place where we don't pay attention to that, which could easily happen with all kinds of ways. And meditation being the best part of it, like that. So I that was that changed everything for me. I kind of knew it, but just to actually feel it and become it, and realize you know the, the tenderness and the fragility that we all are as humans and artists and because of that, we incredibly, totally, completely connected to everything else that's going on, which is really a great source of the world's suffering right now. The other thing was, um, it's, it's almost why people get tired when they go to museums, you know, because each of the paintings are saying, no, me, look at me, no, jump into me. But it was real clear to me that you have a thought and then it goes, blends with your heart and the energy flows down your arm and it goes right through your hand and joins whatever physically contacting it's doing, whether it's in a you know, relationship of, and, and touching, whether it's a paintbrush that goes and starts um, filling up a canvas and all kinds of things like that. It's very profound. It sounds like silly in a way to talk about it, but to think that's another, I guess, example of the connectivity. So in the particular frame, the paintings will have a long time going on with them. And they, um, 
you see how these things are breaking up in kind of dots and it became a person with many eyes. To go back to the bigger one, it will, let me finish, I'll finish the story. Um, the Carlos Castaneda books is this kind of luminous cord that's uh, coming out of the central area that's going off into the distance. And there are some, and then, then it became one, two, three, maybe horses, horse heads, and then they kind of like that, oh, what was that old? kind of boom, 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 you know, kind of gave the sense of they were actually moving, which I like that part of it. And they can almost like there's one leg that you see the legs inside it all. I could, I could keep on painting that kind of uh, application to try to make movement probably for the rest of my life. I'm at, I mean, I, I need a couple more lifetimes to do the things that are appearing now as a painter that I, especially that I want to do. I, I really would love to go back to paint, paint, paint. Um, okay. So that's that one, and it, and then the other thing was that my niece Sarah is very, uh, very smart and very uh, observant. She looked at that cocoon man clay and pointed to the painting and said, "Uncle Bill, don't you see that these are the same thing?" And I had all these decades had not even seen the direct connection between the two of them. Uh -huh. and that was a huge light bulb. Uh -huh. I think and it, then you and then we'll see the, the we'll see the mirrored box where you have the horse with the cocoon rider that you said will maybe be one of your next. It's the it is, it is the next bronze candidate. Which will be wonderful I, I, in the, the the mirrored I, box, Nathan. Sorry to make you jump all around like this, okay. but okay, but that is uh, that's a beautiful reference too, and so. So subtle. That know, yeah. There it is. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the little I, figure. I just this this piece just kind of knocked me out. This I got that from a store that the the box part from some kind of store that was closing down, and I had it sitting around, and I never used it because it was really actually heavy, as you notice, to pick up, and. I am always rearranging things with boxes and containers, you know, because we all we all want a little sanctuary place to to have their little goodies, whether it's inside a, a head lifting off or it's at the coffee table or it's you know a little table by the door when you walk in. So when you saw this, it was it was just you know it's really I, empty. It was playing around with it. All there was was this big giant rock, you know, and then so. <laughs> And I realized, oh, you you really want this piece, you know, after we <laughs> sent the photograph. And so that was kind of like writing the first piece of writing for the other drawing box, the Hopi, Hopi Princess drawing box. So I had the best time doing this because I have bowls and baskets of all kinds of categories of collectibles, like we all do, like artists do especially. And um, some are very personal, some are like heirlooms, some are like things, like, but what filled in uh, the mirrored piece was that um, I found two or three baskets that we could call generic that, that wasn't attached to them anyway. So I put them all there and it was kind of like painting, each little thing went in as a dot dash object in itself. Yeah. And, and they, I probably finished it up in about one afternoon, three, three hours like that. And it was, it was, uh, I just want to say, you know, because you picked it. I know. It had move been transformed by the time we picked it. When we, when we looked at it, it was just the horse and the cocoon rider and that piece of suede and the box was empty with the mirror. And then when we came to pick up, you had, you had, uh, no been very busy, Bill. It was joyous. I was. Oh, uh, that's good. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, it could change. It's like the other ones, like the, the Hopi drawing box, that's, that was a different story. The two boxes were given to me by George to, I think they were from St. Augustine, and I guess they threw lines to catch crabs with. And um, <laughs> it, it was basically a real, you know, 20 years, a, a used drawing box that had all kinds of things in it. And so when we knew it was going to go to the show, well, all right, I know we're going to line up in a minute. Yeah, here we go. When we, uh, I used the bottom part. I never considered the top part till later. And I used the bottom part just a drawing box and it didn't have the 
photograph in it and didn't have half the stuff it had in it. It just made mostly pencils. And I would, I, I liked it. It was nice. And then I found this Curtis Hopi Indian photo um, stuck on a piece of kind of plasters. I don't know what it's some kind of rock. And it look how it broke. It had just broken just so it fit on the top part of the, the, the drawing box. And I kept drawing a little bit with it. And then, um, and then I realized, well, I, I, I don't know, I quit, quit using it as drawing box. And, and I had been gathering these things, uh, all kinds of things. Um, and the difference between the two of them, the, the mirrored piece was uh, application done at one point quickly, da da da, you know, in the afternoon. This represents the drawing box here, represents 30, almost 40 years of just meandering. Uh, maybe one thing a year would go into it. It was, it was just a, mm -hmm. It was not like I was trying to make it happen. It was just there. There's an opium bottle in there. There's a little turquoise piece. There's a this the little kind of winged figure to the uh, the dark figure on the left. This came from a student in Penland. A little smoking pipe. Mm -hmm. It's just stuff like that, like that. And then it finally, you know, the fact that you know I wasn't going to have to make some bright polished frame and you know make it have a tuxedo to live in. And just that it just unfolded itself to me was was such a gift, and it actually had an effect on other things. You know, and I want to say I'm, I'm just thinking at the same time. I'm flashing that um, you know, Nathan's jumping to these details of things, and and I that's what I call the matrix. You know, and it's in an electron microscope on a molecular level, and it's also in a Hubble like the whole vast universe. You know, and it doesn't matter. Uh, what the particulars of that are. It's just that, that to me, when I grog that notion of um, the stuff of life, energetically, visually, sculpturally, mm -hmm. whether you're doing patinas, whether you're doing painting, it's, it's never straight lines, it's camouflage-like, it's the stuff of life. Uh, just, just that even right now when uh, Nathan's showing these details, it's just, it makes me feel good, you know, it makes me feel like, and then, and then the game is, as many of us uh, as painters, we, we love that. We want it to pulse and come and through us and go everything. And then, and then we just like birth of a human being itself, we come out with a figure or a horse. I mean, if I was doing clown face faces or something else, I'd, I'd still be doing the same thing, you know, it's just the horse arriving to me, you know, I guess it, it uh, gotta have something. <laughs> so I just I don't love that all. And that's what I loved about this show. It's that uh, your, your curating and your placement is absolutely impeccable. And I've been some great shows and this is nothing to disdain the one at the Polk and the Daytona Museum of Arts and Sciences, but this is so full of light and the coloring of the wall and the, the exquisite placements and even the bases that are not solid in the bottom, you know, it's just, I, so I thought, well, this perfectly accompanies what I'm trying to do in a given work of art, of uh, finding balance, uh, showing beauty. Uh, you know, you can't talk about it. It gets a little woo woo, but you know, we know it when it happens. And, uh, and, and the fact that you wanted the piece on the right here, which is actually those markings I had this a uh, different shape completely. The main was thing was higher. It was a nice shape, and uh, and I I knocked it off, not good three inches off on the top top right. And I said, I said, like, what the hell did you do that for? And then later on, maybe probably six months later, I ran across this this um, the picture of the uh, fetish by Old Man Acu that we were talking about putting in. Yeah, that's what the lines. I mean, if there's a purpose and intention, those lines and marks were to cut it down further to try to make it look like and the copy of this fetish that I like. Mm -hmm. So by you saying that, oh, you like this just like it is, uh, it just was a big another big revelation. Jeff Whipple wrote a great line about it. It says that like I said, does this need finishing? And he says, well, it. It looks like it wants to say it needs finishing, but the way that you put the marks on to for an organic kind of purpose, show something like he says, show it like 
it is what it's becoming and it keeps a, a kind of a, my take was a life form working with it. And, and that, that orange is probably turmeric. I love turmeric uh, mm -hmm. on every level that put that in and just kind of drawing. So, so there's my handwriting and, and uh, I would say that it can go home just like it is now. That mm -hmm. from having, you know, you're, you're noticing kind of say, well, maybe, maybe something that's, mm -hmm. there's something there's too to just leave it, leave it be, you know, so. It's, you know, and this is an artist's constant dilemma, like when's it finished? And I've got three or four paintings in one frame that I wish I'd taken pictures of. Well, it was surely a joy to stage this show and to work with the various scale objects and juxtapose it. And uh, I, I'm glad that you're happy with it, Bill, but it really was, was our pleasure and they really uh, speak to one another. And this we is, one of, just this tell is one, of my, this, one of my favorite photos of there. You can see Bill has a, a basketball hoop in the studio, but you can also <laughs> see with the little circle there in the corner, this was how we uh, curated the show after our initial visit. We documented everything in photograph and then we identified uh, that's how we we showed Bill this this one this one this one, so it was a great a great process, and great fun great fun to work with Bill as you can tell he's he's a special being. Ditto. Well, and and it's I think that was our intention um, with these two pieces in particular was so much of Bill's work is constantly in process and to include works that aren't finished is kind of highlights that. But I think, you know, we found these, the unfinished marble and the unfinished canvas really right next to each other in this studio. And a huge impulse of mine curatorially was to uh, get a couple semis and bring the whole studio down. <laughs> That be and recreate, recreate the whole studio because it's just such a magical place to walk through and such, mm -hmm. you know, things here and there and stories and yeah. so. there are altars everywhere. That's why the boxes bring such a presence to the, the gallery because uh, they really do uh, reference the, that altar making uh, happening that you have going on in virtually every corner of the studio you know one of the things that i say is a gift and the gift would be your 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 insight into this i i too close to it sometimes and i see it but i don't you know i grew up in a, a very precise um uh severe at times military environment you know and everything had to be just so and it takes a lot of time sometimes to see just what that that's about. So in art making, um, you may you find something to make, and it's sort of mimics you, or it's solid, or it, it ha you want to make wordlessly uh, things that help you understand yourself and and arrive and go to do things like that. And but in that background. I killed and destroyed over by uh, many, especially sculpture um, and paintings, by not knowing when to stop, by overdoing it, by mm -hmm. refining it to such a degree that it, it lost its life, its spirit song inside it like that. And from this show and from, from just what you said just now, it's like, it almost has me feeling like I've got a doorway now to go and return to the abstract expressionist world that I really like and I like it and I love it actually because of what we're looking at right now, which is you what you both picked out of this same non straight line camouflage look, this organicness that maybe some form will pop itself out and then go back again back, back to <clears throat> Redon and Michelangelo and and I, I like some people need severe definitions of things to make them feel solid. And I understand that it's perfectly 
fine, but uh, I mean, and, and I'm even liking this unframed and um, just like a, ta mm -hmm. a tapestry. Incidentally, mm -hmm. these horses arrived, the process of this, these horses arrived from trying to have a photo blow up projection of Rubens, the rape of the daughters of Leucippus. And if you look carefully, I mean, that's where the two horses are from. And if you look uh, underneath the nose of the right horse, there's a woman's faintly looking up and then there's a above somewhere the head or around the head of the left horse is a, the uh, uh, one of the men riders who's swooping down to grab her up and stuff like that. And so, so I like this painting, this drawing actually mixed media because I, I always wanted to make things really exactly the way they are. Of course, this is my result, thankfully. And <laughs> so it was different, different tool making the left head horse and stuff. And then, then using paint. Um, people, I've told you this before. I said, people say, oh, you're such a good painter. And I say, I'm not really that good painter. I'm, I'm more of a mixed media person. I can put a bunch of stuff in together. And I like that the way. And, and I'm, the, uh, the difficult thing about painting was that you lay something on and then how much you how much you keep doing that and then Hiram Williams our teacher was mastered laying stuff on taking it off laying it on taking it off mm -hmm. Illinois Peter Bodner would say if you erase something erase something on any field a couple of times that's one thing but what if you keep making that mark on there and then you erase it 20 times you know you, you're actually integrating the paper you're making something that is a it, 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 it's lo old looking and feeling, but that's not really what you're after. You're after I think that life still lives. I think and maybe even the concept of immortality. There's, mm. there's something about the substance that feeds me. I remember when my dad was in Germany and we were still here in America, and he would send back these cars uh, that were. Um, you know, big as a softball kind of stuff. And, and even, even in war-torn Germany, I, re I remember as a six-year-old that how well they were made, how solid they were, how, what a nice heft it had. And, and, and I think that's so important with, with sculpture, especially. And I, love I just, I just want to say how gorgeous these, your collaborations have been. Um, in presenting your finished works, the bases that your friend George Ferreira has created for you, and, and these solutions for showing the sculptures with the, the metal and then the thread wrapped to hold the piece snugly. But it's so elegant, so beautiful. And, and I would also reference um, some of the cradles that you had made from uh, jewelry makers uh, that would allow the pieces to float and give that impression of uh, artifact to your to your sculptures. I just think it's such a beautiful and thoughtful way to share what you've made and working with other artisans. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, Bernie Reller did those cradles while you were talking, I remember when I was a wee kid that we had this book, uh, we had an encyclopedia for one thing I used to read and then they had this book about all of natural history. And they, I remember these pictures of the old Macedons and their, their orange skins and, and things like that. You know, this is an important piece, that one. Um, yeah, and I, you know, Mm. You're, it's the fine, the finest part. You know, I, I notice that when, when I'm, I'm out of sorts and I need to go to work and I then go to work. And the first part of the process is this kind of meandering around the studio and maybe finishing a letter, maybe sharpening a pencil, maybe like cutting your fingernails. And all of this is these little gestalts or prep work to arriving at a, a given piece. And the concept of a fine artist is what I jump into is that I can take something a certain place, but that there's a gift of the universe inside me that wants to keep, maybe it's the other side of pushing something so far that you ruin it. But it's the, the other part of that is, is when you do it right, or do you do it in harmony, let's say, and that, that refinement it makes me feel refined and then it just shows up like 
-hmm. So you could have this piece. This piece couldn't stand here that we're looking at. I mean, it couldn't stand by itself. There's no legs really. So mm -hmm. I just was doing some other stuff with Bernie Reller and he says, I can do that, you know, and then George made the bass and, and mm -hmm. it's just, it's hard, it's full of harmony. And this particular image, by the way, of that piece comes from one 30,000 year old bone fetish photograph. So there are about four images, you know, and morning greeters, one of them, and the Oman Aku, the bone fetish, there's just something, I mean, I've got variations of a theme within all of this. And I think that uh, where the sculpting and painting come together, especially the sculptures, that there's a real power that's lent. There's a, there's a unspeakable satisfaction I guess of what you would call beauty. And that's what you kind of meander about on the canvas to try to find that whatever it is when it clicks and we all know it and we can't talk about it and it clicks into place and then you smile and you your heart opens and you, you just say, oh, <laughs> this is what I did all this stuff for, <laughs> you know, all these years, little thing. This is a, this is a lovely piece here, I'm very powerful. Now, now we, I just do want to note that we've, we are over our hours time and, and <laughs> want to respect everybody's presence. Um, I don't want to stop the conversation, but perhaps to give a chance, Nathan, for folks to ask questions and sure. comments. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions you can unmute yourself and kind of shout out or you're welcome to put into the chat. The chat box has been pretty active the whole time, um, mostly with comments, not questions, but um, we can go through those if nobody has questions or we can just keep keep talking. But oh, Leslie is raising your hand. Go ahead, Leslie. So I, I wanted to make a, a comment about um, how Bill and Nancy and I know each other for, gosh, over four decades. <laughs> so we, we have a, a lot of rich history and, and we have influenced each other. And we all studied with Hiram Williams who influenced us. And recently the critic, Jerry Salt, who, you know, if you're on Instagram, you see him several times a day. He had this marvelous quote that I meant to send to Nancy the other day, but so now I can say it to Bill and to Nancy and to everybody while we're together. And the quote is by a painter by the name of Stanley Whitney. And I had to look him up because I didn't know him. And the quote is so perfect for how the three of us work and maybe others of you work the same way. And the quote is, a bad day in the studio is a good day in the studio because you're trying to take it to a different level. Mm, I love it. Nice. I love it. And, and I want to say one more thing about Bill. You know, I, I have a personal mantra, which you obviously have as well, and that is go deep, don't go wide. So for mm. most of your life, you have used one thing, it's not the right word, the horse as all of these different, very, very meaningful and very deep um, messages. And so I, I appreciate that you saying put truth to that saying that you can in fact make consistently meaningful and different work by going deep and not going wide. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Yes. Appreciate it. I also would like to interject that at our reception, it was so lovely to see so many of Bill's friends come by, artist friends and uh, hometown friends, because Bill is from the first graduating class of the Dunedin High School in 1962, and he named our high school team, the Falcons, <laughs> which is just was unbelievable to me when, when we realized that. So it has been really a, a, 
a pleasure and people keep reaching out and oh I, I is Bill coming back I want to see him so it was it's beautiful to see the the parade of, of folks coming through who are so happy to see what you're doing and and reconnect yeah <laughs> and he will be offering a, a workshop yes he did do a demo already that was leading into our reception weekend and he will be offering a one-day workshop on february 12th from 10 to 4 so if you're interested in that it's available for registration on our website or you can call us but you can see um, the handheld fetishes so if you're interested in owning work too there's quite a range of, of beautiful pieces available at all price levels. And the handheld fetishes are especially um, gorgeous. Um, thank you. I want to say one last one thing about the workshop is that um, and it, it, there's some writ about it writing, but it's mm -hmm. it, since I've been thinking about it, it's all different now anyway, it changes all the time. I go watch Nancy paint something and then it changes. But when when I was in academics, I think I was in 20 places over 14 years, I generally taught drawing, sometimes painting, but I always taught drawing in connection with writing because I can call myself a writer just because I write often and that'll do for me. So everybody who was an illustrator person wanted to write something about it to clarify and everybody who was a writer uh, wanted illustrations for the things that writing brought forth. So, and, and how I would do this workshop just changes all the time because it's just one and then it's the other. And like I say, it's, it is a pathway to the concept of and practice of mindfulness, which is much needed. This piece is, the two pieces that we're looking at right now was a, a piece on the right of soapstone. It was made in, uh, I guess we got to go soon, right? Uh, it was made at Osabaugh Island off the coast of Savannah. And the, just the, the salient feature about it was if if I had been been my usual German, anal German person, I would have scoured out those those rough spots, as you can see in the front left part there where the arrow is. And <clears throat> this place is like wonderful. And it was, it's, it's, I won't get into it but it was it just got me free like that well frankly i had been working on this and i just was lazy and i was tired of doing it on the piece on the right so and something said you know it's okay you know you don't have to fill everything make everything like that and so the next day after i decided i was done with it it's also got the roaming the air symbol etched into the to the it the awakening part is coming in and seeing it in the studio and sort of saying, hmm, that's not so bad. You know, it's like actually the lesson was the smooth makes the rough uh, more enhancing and the rough gives contrast to the smooth and that's life itself. So it's, it's a, art is a great teacher. We would be so much better off if it was um, far more accepted and approved. Um, then I guess this is probably our the oldest piece in the show, isn't it, Bill? 1969. You... Yeah, 1969. And I used to do a, a many paintings during that time. I've I found I find them in slides that uh, pre pre uh, graduate school uh, when I couldn't uh, so solve something in painting. In a particular painting, I was I was already doing this even before Peru. I was breaking things down into organic fractiles, and I really liked what you wrote about that fractile business because it's the units, the molecular structure, you know, the peptides and everything talking to each other. So some paintings get totally like you see in the bottom part of this of uh, just break breaking down these little units, and uh, and then could be a field painting of it and meaning nothing but that. And then, so this was just, this just happened to end up not doing that completely. And then there were these lovers showed up and um, turned out okay, you know. Talk about giving people credit, Hector Poog in 
at 706 in Gainesville has been framing things for me for a long time. And he, I don't even, I don't even say what I want anymore. So it's really nice. <laughs> he, he gets it. So it's great. Uh, it's, it's amazing. To, I mean, I have, you know, everything went digital at a certain time, but I go around my studio and I'm amazed. I've got these, these books of, of slides and they're still after all these horrible elements in my studio, they're still there. And, and, and I think, God, this is amazing. Like I've been doing this all this time and, mm -hmm. and I, I am saved by work. I know any artist will tell you that if they, they're doing it, and Catherine mm -hmm. knows that and every, she's a serious artist and you're a serious artist, Nathan, and it saves us. It's, it's a place mm -hmm. to go. And we, 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 we solve problems and they're not verbal and they're not intellectual. They just are places of comfort and knowingness and, and I guess that's why they call it magical. It's just tricky talking about it. It's really hard. You do well. Huh. And we appreciate it. I appreciate you. I appreciate you all so much for this. Well, we have more images to look at, um, although we are a little past our time. Um, so just a quick note to everyone that this will be placed on the Deneen Fine Arts Center YouTube page after we polish it up. Um, so it'll be available to share and watch until the internet breaks. And then um, we want to just quickly announce our next virtual conversation with our award-winning artist in our show, Small is Beautiful. It's our community call for art um, centered around miniatures. And then what I found really interesting was the juxtaposition with some of Bill's very large works. <clears throat> so it's a fun show to come see. And we'll be talking to uh, some artists next week at 10 a.m. You can register here. Um, is there any more questions for Bill? out there. We had one person in the chat say we should take a bus tour up to the studio. Ooh. <laughs> I think that, that was Ted. Be, Ted. That would be fun. Hey, that's me. The, the, the studio, studio is, is wonderful. And Bill's my brother and I hope you get to take a bunch of people there. Uh, yes. It's, it's actually, it's, it was kind of forlorn with half its juice gone with the, jumped over to your place so it's interesting i'm still pooping around and making little order of things and and <laughs> delving into things and what I, what am i going to do anyway you know it's like it's a great thing to after all this time to actually say hey i guess i really am an artist <laughs> <laughs> um, if you do go to the studio make sure you don't do it in the middle of the summer <laughs> very very hot mm -hmm. Things to change. Thank yeah, you. But it's, a, it's a pretty magical place to go. So if you have the opportunity, and if if Bill is. Well, there's a picture of me sitting. If he's receiving, right. And then yeah. with, and Ted took the picture. We just talked and I got that. It was so hot that day. I got heat stroke and I was, it was, it was not fun. So anyway. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank just, it's just, I'm so grateful for this stuff. I'm so grateful for the show. I'm so grateful for all the people that have blended with me and let me blend with them. It's, it's really, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, well, it's lovely. It's just totally lovely and, and affirmative. Thank you. It is for us, for us as well, Bill. We look forward to, uh, the remainder of the show and receiving more folks uh, on site and a successful workshop. So thanks to everyone who came today. Great to see you, Leslie and Nancy and Kathy. Yay, Kathy. <laughs> I couldn't quite see everybody. So it's been a it's been a joy. Hope to see you all soon.